Okay, um, I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker, Sean Carroll uh, from Caltech. Uh, I should point out that uh, colloquium speakers this year undergo strict, very strict selections. And uh, Sean was uh, the speaker who was selected by both faculty committee as well as the graduate student committee. And that, that's the only case uh, that we have uh, <laughs> this year. Uh, and there is a reason for that. Uh, on science grounds, uh, I don't know of any single interesting question in cosmology that Sean doesn't have a paper on, and you look at those papers and there is always something very meaningful and interesting in them. Uh, and Sean also has written uh, the, uh, the textbook in general relativity, which as I understand is broadly used around the country, but he has also written a number of popular uh, physics books and cosmology books, uh, which uh, I think are also very interesting. Um, so today, Sean is going to tell us about the effective field theory approach to cosmological large-scale uh, structure formation. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And thanks to the grad students who uh, uh, voted for me as well as for the faculty. And uh, you know, I hope that I do OK. This is a slightly experimental talk. It's uh, slightly different. Uh, for the past, I don't know, 15 years, I've been fortunate enough to have really crowd-pleasing topics to talk about for colloquia when I give them. Uh, the acceleration of the universe, modified gravity, interacting, dark matter, the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the origin of the universe, the arrow of time, stuff like that. So this is not going to be one of those. Today I'll be talking about a mathematical formalism. And furthermore, it's a mathematical formalism that isn't even very well developed yet. And it doesn't really have a lot of what they call results in the mathematical formalism game. And finally, I'm not even the world's expert in this mathematical formalism. Uh, I've been working on it for less than a year, and I have one paper out on it. Uh, so I can't, it's not even like I've been doing this for 10 years, so I'm going to share with you the brightest jewels in the crown of this long-term project. Uh, but what I hope is that I, I make up for my lack of wisdom with the enthusiasm of a newly converted person. Uh, I really think that this approach to thinking about large-scale structure is very promising for the future. Thinking about it has led us to sort of understand some things about effective field theories more generally that I think is, are, is very useful. But really, I, there's two goals here. One is to get new people enthusiastic about the approach. It's not anywhere near a mature field yet. There's still a lot of low-hanging fruit ready to be picked if you want to start uh, thinking about this stuff. And number two, to advertise the fact that uh, I have these wonderfully brilliant young collaborators who've done great work. Stefan Leichenauer is a postdoc at Caltech and Jason Pollock is a grad student there. And you know, we just got very enthusiastic about this and we're hopeful about what the future is going to bring. So with that in mind, the outline is pretty simple. Um, I'm going to talk about the, what you get in every talk on effective field theory. You know, physicists, you, you can't hang around physics departments too long without being given the, the conversion talk about effective field theory and how wonderful it is and how useful it is. So I will give you that talk. Um, then I will talk about the regular way, the standard way of doing cosmological perturbation theory. We're lucky enough to live in a universe that is almost uniform, but the fact that it's not quite uniform is of crucial importance. So we do perturbation theory to understand those small deviations from uniformity, and there's something called standard cosmological perturbation theory. And along with thinking about that, I'll tell you why effective field theory is probably better. And then finally, I will give you a tedious and overly technical discussion of what we actually did, how to actually construct the effective theory, and some of the surprising things we uncovered along the way, especially how it's really not a conventional hydrodynamic theory. Your hope and your expectation is that the evolution of galaxies and dark matter and so forth on the largest scales is described as an effective fluid, but we're saying that that's actually not completely true. It's kind of almost true, but not quite, which is kind of interesting. So let's think about uh, effective theories in general. And effective theories are just the word that field theorists like to use for what is really the very uh, broad idea of emergent descriptions of phenomena on large scales. It very, very often happens in physics that you have some system which really has some enormously large number of degrees of freedom. That is to say, if there's an equation, a differential equation describing that system, there would be many, 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 many variables in that equation. But nevertheless, we can make tremendous progress by ignoring them. The actual interesting dynamics in some very large region of parameter space 
kind of collapses to a small submanifold of the phase space, and there's a smaller number of variables that capture all the interesting stuff within some regime. So that is called emergence in the general literature, and effective field theories are just a particular approach to that. So just to get you feeling that you're completely comfortable with this idea, as physicists, you have been introduced to billiard balls bouncing off each other. And if you were asked how many degrees of freedom are there in the problem of two billiard balls bouncing off each other, you might say, you know, there's the position and the momentum of the billiard balls. Now really, that's a very good description, but it's nowhere near complete, right? That billiard ball has Avogadro's number times a few molecules in it, or elementary particles, or quantum field vibrations, or whatever you want to call them. And every one of them is a degree of freedom doing something. But the nice thing about the billiard ball system is you can ignore, for very many purposes, the individual motion of the atoms, the molecules, the particles, and just describe it as basically perfectly elastic spheres bumping off of each other. What's a little bit trickier is, of course, that some systems fall into this nice category of having a, an easy effective description, and some don't. And you have to kind of think about whether or not any individual system does or doesn't. So you might care not about billiard balls, but about human beings. You might say, well, what happens when two human beings interact with each other? And you don't need to keep track of every individual molecule in the human being, but nevertheless, there's a much richer spectrum of possible outcomes when two human beings meet each other. They might get into an argument, they might get into a fight, they might ignore each other, they might form a bound state of some sort. It's a very complicated dynamics. The search for the effective field theory of just two-body collision of human beings is an ongoing project. That's why the psychology department and the physics department at NYU are right next to each other. So in the context of cosmology, particle physics, and things like that, you notice I'm, I'm talking about effective theories, and sometimes I will slip and say effective field theories, these are not the same thing. Effective field theories are a subclassification of effective theories. But it very often happens in physics that the kind of effective theories we have are field theories. So the very classic example, the most obvious example you should have in your mind is not billiard balls, but hydrodynamics, or the transition from point particle descriptions of fluids to continuum descriptions of fluids. So imagine you have some distribution function. There's some particles. This is supposed to be position, and this is the density. So the density is just a delta function at the position of every particle. The real microscopic description here would be given in terms of something like the Boltzmann equation. So you think that, well, maybe I don't have a complete knowledge of where the microstates are, where every individual particle is, but I have some distribution function that tells me the probability density of different particles having a, a number density, a, a kinetic energy, and so forth, in different regions of space. So that means I have some distribution function on phase space. I integrate it over the momenta, because I don't care what the momenta are, just to get the density of actual particles, which would just be the, the mass, if this is the energy density, the mass times times the delta function at every location. So there's a lot of variables here, right? There's the position, possibly the velocity of every one of those particles. It's a large number of particles. So not only can I simply state that there's probably some continuum fluid description, I can construct it explicitly. I can introduce a smoothing function. So there's, I just invent some function that basically smooths things over some region. And this is uh, an example, just a, a Gaussian, and I multiply it by the actual density, and then I integrate uh, by moving the smoothing function from place to place, and what I get is a smooth function. This is not a very smooth function because my skills at PowerPoint are not what they could be, but you know what I mean. You take the density, which is a bunch of delta functions, you integrate it with respect to this smoothing function, and you get a new density function that doesn't have any structure on small scales, but keeps all the information on large scales. So this number lambda is the length scale over which you are smoothing things. If you have particles that are closer than lambda, they will just get lumped together. Things going over on scales larger than lambda count differently. So this smoothing variable lambda is going to be, turn out to be very important later in the talk. But the point is we went from a microscopic description of individual particles to a macroscopic fluid. Now you might say, wait a minute, that's actually not a decrease in the number of variables because you had some large number of variables here and now you have infinity variables. You have the value of the field at every point. 
But in real world applications, we don't consider this function to be an infinite number of variables. We've actually, after all, we've smoothed it. There's no structure on small scales. So if you take the Fourier transform, only the long distance wavelengths would matter. Or you could just put it on a lattice, and if the lattice is smaller than the smoothing scale, you keep all the information. So in fact, the amount of information you need to keep track of in this description is much less than that description. And what you want to know is, does that do a good job of describing the fluids? And for the air in this room, and for water, and for all the things that we just studied in the 19th century, yes, this, this procedure works very, very well. So in particular, you could derive the, you know, the Navier-Stokes equations and so forth from the Boltzmann equation, if you wanted to use this method. Uh, so I need to say some words about effective field theories in particular. So what I was saying in the last slide was that a continuum description of point particles is a classic example of an emergent theory. And it's an example of a more general phenomenon that very often your effective theory is a field theory. Which, which, by which I mean that the variables are fields, things that take on values at different points in space, and interact with each other locally in space. So effective field theory, effective theories are a very general idea. Field theories are more specific, and it is a feature of the real world, a feature of the actual laws of physics as we know them, that effective field theories are the ones that turn out to be useful. So what does it mean to have a field theory versus a not field theory? This is a field theory. So this is the action that we would uh, minimize to get equations of motion. It is a functional of some field or set of fields phi. And the reason why it's a field theory is not because the variables are fields, but because the action is an integral over space-time of a local function. So the whole theory is encompassed in one integral over space-time. The Lagrange density is a local function of phi and its derivatives. So to have something that is not a field theory would mean that, for example, you would need to integrate over space twice, or an infinite number of times, or something like that. It's very easy to imagine things other than local field theories, but we're just so used to them that we think that that's the way nature works, and it actually does pretty well to assume that. The reason why is because space is what interactions are local in. When do two uh, particles interact with each other when they are at the same point in space, when they bump into each other? They don't interact with each other when they're, they're at the same point in momentum space or anything like that. That is why field theories turn out to be very useful. And in particular, still specializing more, the place where effective field theories are most obviously used is in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, we really have control over what happens over different length scales. And this was the great um, contribution of Ken Wilson, who passed away this year, Nobel Prize winner, um, who actually got interested in this. He was a Caltech student. He, there's all sorts of interesting stories I heard at Caltech once uh, Wilson died, uh, because he was you know, an unusual student. He, he said as an undergraduate, all of his, the smartest friends that he had all went into particle theory. Therefore, he vowed not to go into particle theory. So he went into finance, and he found that was very boring. So he went to particle theory instead. And he went to Caltech, and he went to Richard Feynman's office, and he knocked on the door, and he asked Feynman, what should I work on, and do you have any ideas for me, and Feynman said, no. Uh, and then he knocked on Murray Gelman's door, and Gelman wrote down the partition function for the three-dimensional Ising model and said, it would be great if you could solve this. That wasn't going to go anywhere either. And so uh, he fell in with people who were interested in computers in the 1960s. And that was not a big deal. Uh, that was not a, a, a thing that particle physicists did. But he was interested in putting field theories onto computers, doing them numerically, which meant building a lattice theory. And he helped sort of think about lattices. And that led him to the renormalization group and effective field theories. So the, the way that I think about this sort of intuitively is in quantum field theory, you you calculate processes like the decay of one particle into two more by summing up Feynman diagrams. Now, if you read the news recently, there's other ways to do this that might be more effective in, in broader context. But still, we like to sum up Feynman diagrams, which means that we start with a simple uh, tree level process where just the two lines, the one line breaks into two. But then there are loop diagrams also where there are virtual particles running around in the middle. And there are more and more complicated loops. And we hope that this is an infinite series, but every one of the terms in the series gets smaller and smaller, or at least you can renormalize it until it gets smaller and smaller. And then you get a finite answer, and that is your uh, scattering cross-section, or decay rate. 
it might be the case that the problem here, not the problem, but a feature of this way of thinking about things is that the, what the loop means is that there's a particle with momentum on every line, and for the external lines, you specify the momentum. You tell me what the momentum is. For the internal lines, you integrate over all the possible values of the momentum. So in these loops, you have particles with momentum going from sort of minus infinity to plus infinity. Energy is conserved at every vertex. So there's a finite momentum going in, but there are an infinite number of ways I can break up a finite momentum into two different values going up and down. So I integrate over there, over the inside of the loop, all the way up to very, very, very high energies. And at high energies, in quantum field theory, new phenomena might come in. New particles, breakdown of space-time, blah, blah, blah. So the effective field theory philosophy is to say we shouldn't care about, we shouldn't need to care about what goes on at really, really, really high energies inside the loops. So there should be some way of thinking about this blob all by itself without necessarily knowing all the details of every Feynman diagram and every integral up to infinite momentum. That is what effective field theory in quantum theory gives you. And Wilson gave you a way to think about it rather than in terms of diagrams, in terms of the path integral. So Feynman says you can do quantum theory by taking the action, S, exponentiating it, and then integrating over all of the different classical field configurations. So the field con in field theory, that would be phi, the field configuration. You integrate over all of them. And this should give you the amplitude, for example, for whatever process you want, one particle decaying into two, for example. What Wilson says is, when you look at these diagrams, you're inspired to think the short wavelength excitations of the field are what we shouldn't need to care about. By short wavelength, I mean shorter than what we care about. And therefore, we don't care about them. What we care about are the long wavelength, the low energy, uh, the low mass degrees of freedom. So I can take my integral over all field configurations and I can divide it up in, into an integral over long wavelength wavelength field configurations, and an integral over short wavelength ones, phi L and phi S. This is just math. I didn't do anything there. I just wrote the integral measure in a slightly different way. And then I can take this part of the path integral, and I can claim that I have done it. That is to say, I can write it as the path integral over just the long wavelength modes of a different action, S sub lambda. So lambda is our cutoff. Lambda is the wavelength below which, lambda is actually momentum. So the inverse momentum below which, things are too short wavelength for us to care about. And on long wavelengths, we're still keeping the information. So this first step is just math. This second step is physics. This was just a rewriting of variables, but the second step is saying something substantive about the way the long wavelength fields behave. It's saying that the integral over the short wavelength fields gives us a new action. Here it is. It's the logarithm of this thing on the right-hand side. And that action is still the action for a local field theory, and that is the effective field theory. So this is just formalism, but you can actually make it very, very concrete and applicable. So for example, this was done way before Wilson, but a, a classic early example of an effective field theory came from Euler and Heisenberg. They wanted to know about, you know, they were, it was the early days of quantum field theory. They knew about the Dirac equation. They were trying to treat the electron as a field, just like we treat the photon as an electromagnetic field. And they were doing the equivalent of calculating this Feynman diagram. They didn't have Feynman diagrams at the time, but they could still do the math that is associated with this process. So this is two photons going in. You read this from left to right. Two photons go in. There's an electron. So this photon sort of splits off into an electron and a positron. The positron joins up with this photon to make an electron, etc., and you get two photons coming out. The point is, if you didn't have electrons around, two photons would never scatter off of each other. Two photons all by themselves in classical electromagnetism just go right on by. In quantum field theory, you get this virtual process. These are virtual particles running around inside the loop, virtual particles with all possible momenta, and they contribute to an effective scattering possibility of these two photons scattering off of each other and changing, exchanging momentum with each other. So there's two attitudes you could take. One is, I'm just going to calculate every single possible diagram. I'm going to add up all the different processes. I'm going to figure out what can happen. And that's what you would have done in the 1930s and so forth. The other attitude you can take is, look, no matter what goes on inside the loop, 
I know that what's happening is two photons are coming in and two photons are going out. And I know that the way to describe photons is with the electromagnetic field, the E field and the B field. And I know that because I know special relativity that I should bundle up the E field and the B field into F mu nu, the electromagnetic field strength tensor. And there's a lot of symmetry there. There's gauge invariance, which says it must be F mu nu. It, must, it couldn't be anything else. There's Lorentz invariance, which says I must sum over all these indices. I can't have any vectors lying around with unsummed indices. So all that symmetry means that if I want to describe the interactions of these two photons, there just aren't that many possibilities. If I write down the Lagrange density, the thing that I would integrate up to make an action, I have this piece, which Maxwell would have recognized if he, if he knew about Lagrange densities. This is just the photons going all by themselves. And these two terms are sort of the first things you could possibly invent that describe photons interacting with each other. There aren't anything, any other possible terms you could write down at this order. Anything at higher order would be suppressed by an even larger number in the denominator there. So the first attitude is, I'm going to calculate every diagram. The second attitude is, there is an effective coefficient a and b for these two terms. I'm going to calculate those two things, and then I can figure out whatever process I'm interested in. The entire dynamics of the photons at low energies must be encompassed in this effective theory with just two new parameters. And you can actually look them up. They, there are values for A and B, minus 36, blah, 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 with alphas in there and so forth. And that tells you very effectively, still used in atomic physics today, the Euler-Heisenberg effective Lagrangian for describing photons scattering off of each other. And often, so you see what happens is that this is a dimensionless coefficient. The higher order terms, if you do dimensional analysis, are suppressed by more and more powers of some mass scale, which we take to be the cutoff, the cutoff separating long wavelengths and short wavelengths. And very often it's the case that you can push the cutoff higher and higher until you hit a point where it's really new physics kicking in and your effective field theory breaks down. In this case, it would be the mass of the electron. You need to actually treat the electron as a separate propagating particle if you are having momenta for these original photons that were higher than the mass of the electron. So, this... Yeah, the, with some alphas, huh? Sorry? With some alphas, probably. The alphas are in the expression for A, yeah. If you, if you write down the numerical expression for A and B, alpha would be in there, absolutely. And the mass of the electron okay. and so forth, yeah. So, we, we have this feature that, that I promised, that this is a local field theory. It's not the field theory you started with, it's the effective field theory of only the photons, but it's still a field theory. And it didn't have to be. What if you were sort of, what if you knew a little bit about what Euler and Heisenberg did, but you didn't really appreciate exactly what they did? You might want to calculate the scattering of two electrons with photons being exchanged. Now, from the first point of view, scattering uh, electrons and just calculating the Feynman diagrams, yes, you do this. It's a very, this is a, something that you will do in Peskin and Schroeder. Every, every, uh, it's the kind, of, the kind of thing, if not exactly the thing, that every first year, every student taking quantum field theory for the first time would be asked to do. What you can't do is find an effective theory that ignores the photons. You cannot, you can find an effective theory of photons by integrating out electrons, you cannot find an effective theory of electrons by integrating out photons. And why is that? Because the electrons have a mass. And in quantum mechanics, that mass, the reciprocal of that mass, roughly tells me the wavelength, the Compton wavelength of the electron, and therefore roughly tells me how far the electron can seep out as a quantum virtual particle. So in this loop, everything going on in that loop, the important stuff is that wavelength shorter than one over the mass of the electron. But the photon has a mass zero. There, every, wa sorry, every wavelength is shorter than one over the mass of the photon. So there is no scale below which I can ignore the photons. That doesn't mean I couldn't turn a crank and get an effective theory. What it means is the effective theory would not be local. It would not be a local theory because this loop doesn't collapse at long wavelengths. At, at, when you look at it from far away, it doesn't collapse to things only happening at short distances. So you have to be a little bit careful about when you have a real field theory as your effective theory and when you don't. All right. So that's the pep talk, and now let's apply it to cosmology. 
I presume you all know the basic story that we have in modern cosmology. In the early universe, we have a very, very smooth distribution of matter, but not perfectly smooth. There are fluctuations, and they grow with time. Very fortunately, and so you do numerical simulations, this is a smooth early universe, and over time it becomes lumpier. Gravity turns up the contrast knob on the universe. And fortunately for us, the shorter wavelengths become big, the amplitudes become big before those of the longer wavelengths. So as long as the amount of perturbation is small, we think we can understand things analytically. We can just do perturbation theory and know what's going on. Once the so-called perturbations are large, once the change in density is of order of the density, once delta rho over rho is of order one, you can't do perturbation theory. Things become nonlinear, we say, and it's harder to uh, actually get numerical analytic answers. In the real world, that scale is about 10 megaparsecs. So for structures smaller than 10 megaparsecs, it's nonlinear and hard. For structures larger than 10 megaparsecs, it's linear and roughly easy. So what we would like is to get an effective field theory for just the long wavelength modes. In other words, all the stuff on small scales is churning around doing stuff, but we don't care. We want to be able to describe the perturbative linear regime. And this is a, a tiny little bandwagon that people have been on for the past couple of years. Here's, a, here's the full list of, uh, in our paper of our citations to this work. Uh, so Leonardo Senatore, uh, Matias Aldariaga, John Joseph Carrasco have been some of the people who have been very active in this field. But there's still plenty of room for work to be done. It's, it is not nearly, uh, it's not a very big, big bandwagon yet. So. Let's contrast this effective field theory approach to standard perturbation theory. I told you that you'd start with point particles and smooth them, but really nobody does that for large scale structure. We start already assuming that there's a fluid and then we smooth it even more. That's what we're actually gonna do. So the variables we start with are the energy density of our fluid and the velocity of our fluid. And in fact, we're not even gonna start with those. It turns out to be much more convenient to work with delta rho over rho, because you have some density in the whole universe that is declining with time as the universe expands. So we basically divide that out and work with delta as our density variable. And it also turns out that in this vector field, the velocity, there's sort of a curl piece and a gradient piece, and the curl piece dies away very, very quickly. So all we need is the divergence of this vector field. So we turn that vector into a scalar by taking its derivative, and it's these two things, delta and theta, which we want to track their motion, their evolution through the universe. So, sorry, Sean, can you explain a little bit? Because if, if all you want is greater than 10 megaparsec, can't you just use Kraftsoff? Can I just use what? Kraftsoff. Oh, yeah, but I'm gonna I'm gonna say that I can that I can beat him in a fair fight. So the claim is you can do yeah, better. I can do better. That's right. Cheaper, easier, and better. Cheaper, easier, and equally good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that'll be the point. All right. So uh, there are equations for the density and for the velocity, and here they are. Um, you know. I hope you've had fun so far in the talk, because there will be equations from now on. And I'm trying my best to keep them kind of understandable and short, sometimes at the cost of uh, transparency. But here are the two equations. So here's delta. It's in Fourier space, so it's a, it's a function of wave number. Uh, delta dot has a term that is driven by the velocity. And what this means is it's a convolution in K space. So really this notation is a fancy way of writing an integral over momentum of some function that is fixed times this function f times this variable, the variable f and the variable g. So this is an integral over momentum of delta of q times theta of k minus q. Okay, so this is just the Fourier transform of the product of delta and theta in position space. And likewise, there's, a, there's a, an equation for k, for, for theta, rather. So all you need to remember from this slide is that there is a first order equation for delta that has a quadratic term. There's a first order equation for theta that has a quadratic term in addition to also the linear terms. And th this, these equations describe a pressureless Newtonian fluid. So most of the matter in the universe is dark matter, which we well approximate as stuff that just doesn't interact. It's just cold, non-interacting particles. At the fluid level, that means a pressureless fluid. So your first guess as to how to describe the evolution of large-scale structure 
is as a pressureless fluid. The effective theory will not make that assumption. The effective the field theory will start here and show you what the effective pressure is when you take into account the effects of small scale nonlinear dynamics. Can you repeat yeah. the alpha again? That's the Fourier term? Alpha is some function. Yeah. Uh, it's in our paper. I just didn't want to bother. It's a different function in these two cases, actually, but it's known. It's just a way of writing the fluid equations. Okay, so now to simplify things even further, rather than writing delta and theta and having two quantities which are interacting with each other, since all I'm doing is going to be formalism, just imagine I have one field and I call it sorry, phi. Sorry, I still don't understand. So you are doing effective field theory of Newtonian fluid, or you are doing effective field theory of galaxies, or is it the same thing? No, effective field theory of Newtonian fluid. And you claim it will work for galaxies? Yes, absolutely. Okay. That's right. So, uh, so right now, I'm doing the effective theory of a single field that obeys an equation of motion like this. It has a linear time derivative term, a linear term, and some quadratic interaction. So this is just perturbation theory. We know how to do it. It's a classical mechanics. There's nothing quantum about anything here. We just do perturbation theory, turning a crank. So we take phi, and, it, and phi is assumed to be small. And so if I were a little bit more careful, I'd be putting epsilons here and keeping track of the powers, but I'm just going to trust that you can follow the subscripts. So there's a first order piece, a second order piece, a third order piece, etc. And I can solve this top equation iteratively by first setting all the things to zero and then plugging in. So if I do just the linear piece of this equation, then I'm basically throwing away the interaction. I get something I can solve exactly, and I call that phi 1. Phi 1 is the solution to this equation with no interaction, just the phi dot plus a phi piece. And I write that as some green function times the initial conditions. So you give me the field at some time, I just propagate it up. So I call this the propagator in quantum field theory. The green function, whatever you want to call it, g is the function that evolves phi from its initial conditions to some other time tau. Then I put, then I allow for the interaction, and I take phi 1 and I plug it back in, and I call the resulting solution phi 2. And there's an integral over time, and there's an integral over the initial conditions. What happens is that phi 2, its name makes sense because it's proportional to two factors of phi 1. So there's 1 phi 1 with one momentum, 1 phi 1 with the other momentum, and I integrate over momenta, and there's other factors of the coupling constant and the green function, and it's just work and algebra, and it gets harder and harder and uglier and uglier and more and more depressing as it goes on. So here's phi 3. All you need to know are two things. Number one, there are three factors of phi 1. There's one, there's one, and there's one. And number two, I'm integrating over all the different ways that the momenta, these initial phi 1s, can combine to make the momentum of the final phi 3. It's just classical perturbation theory. Anyone can do it, no one will love it doing this. And therefore, uh, to the rescue comes Richard Feynman. This is, uh, just to break up the monotony of the equations, this is a picture of Richard Feynman's desk. It is also my desk at Caltech. That's why I have a picture of it. Uh, Feynman's desk was preserved after Feynman himself left. Every September, a new year starts and the new graduate students come in and like take pictures of my desk and so forth. And people want to know why I got Feynman's desk. And the, the real answer is the Feynman's desk goes to the most senior person in the theory group who is not senior enough to deserve a brand new desk when they get there. So <laughs> this is my desk. And one of the things that Feynman famously did is to show us how to make perturbation theory more pleasant by associating pictures with all of those little equations. So you have some variable, phi, that has a first order piece, second order piece, etc. And all of those solutions we wrote down can be expressed pictorially. So here is the solution for phi 1. It's a, a propagator times the initial condition. So now in this diagram, time is running upward, because we're cosmologists now, not particle physicists. So we start at the initial condition, we propagate it up, and we get the final answer. So there's phi, one, phi in, it's right down there. You green function it up, and you get the final answer at some time tau. For the second order piece, you get this integral over two copies of phi 1. Diagrammatically, that means there's two different initial phi's. They come in, they interact with this coupling constant b, and they make a phi 2. 
phi 3 is the same thing. This whole long equation is just expressing the fact that there's three initial phi's coming in on three different lines, and they contribute to phi 3, etc. You can go on forever. And the nice thing is that there's an exact map between these pictures and these equations. So you don't need to derive the, picture, the equations from scratch. You can just draw the pictures and figure out what the equation should be. So this is classical field theory, like I said. You might remember that Feynman was doing quantum field theory. So there is a difference between classical field theory and quantum field theory. The diagrams still match perfectly, but there's no loops in any of these diagrams. Roughly speaking, and this is not perfect, but pretty good, roughly speaking, the loops in real Feynman diagrams are a purely quantum mechanical effect. They come from virtual particles, or as we would say in the lingo, off-shell vibrations in the quantum fields. And in classical physics, they're not there. So you can do classical field perturbation theory with Feynman diagrams, but they would all be tree diagrams. Now, in fact, in cosmology, we will get loop diagrams, even though everything is purely classical. So how does that happen? The answer is we don't care about phi. We don't care, we don't try to calculate what is the density of matter in the universe at some particular place in the universe. That's not something that our theories can predict. All we can predict are statistical properties of the fluctuations in density from place to place. So you might say, let's calculate the average value of the density, but that is equal to the average density. So delta, the average value of delta is zero. That's not a very interesting thing to calculate. The interesting things to calculate are the correlators, the correlation functions between, uh, this is a super compact notation, but this is one mode of the fluctuation field and this is another mode, or in, uh, because I've written it in Fourier space, in position space, given that the density is some value over here, what is it likely to be over there? That's what the correlation function is telling you. So if I have what is called the two-point correlation function, just two copies of phi, these angle brackets mean the expectation value in all of the different possible stochastic realizations of the initial density field evolved up to the present time. That is what we call the power spectrum the amount of power at any one scale, because this really should be phi i of k by j of k prime, but there's a delta function over here, so only one k comes in. Anyway, all of this is to say, the thing we want to calculate is not phi, but two copies of phi and how they're related to each other. So you just take phi 1, phi 2, and take this expectation value, sorry, phi 1 and phi 1 again, take the expectation value, but I've told you what the answer is for phi 1, oops, phi 1 is just the green function, the propagator times the initial condition. So I plug that in, and then the green function I just take outside, and I just get two copies of the initial phi, and that's just the power spectrum, the initial power spectrum. So secretly what's happening is I have two propagators taking my initial condition to the present day, but they're connected down here by the initial power spectrum. So this is what we call a contraction. We sum over the momentum, but there's a delta function, so it doesn't look like there's a sum there. But if you get more complicated diagrams, then you're going to get integrals over loop momenta. So what if you want to get the correlation function between the first order perturbation and the third order perturbation? Well, the third order perturbation has three initial conditions down here. And if you dig into the equation, you end up integrating over the momentum that runs around in this loop. So remember, every line here is some phi of k with some momentum. And in those equations, there are integrals. And so this red quadrilateral is a loop that we're integrating over the momentum. So we know what the final momentum is up here and up there. But to get it, the intermediate states involve all the different momenta for the initial conditions. So it's kind of cute, right? Because we're doing classical field theory. In classical field theory, we only get tree diagrams. But combining classical field theory with stochastic initial conditions gets us back to loops and Feynman diagrams. And if you've ever done any quantum field theory, you know the problem with loops. They tend to diverge. It's very often the case that the actual value of the integral you do is infinity. And that's bad. So this loop that we're doing over here, this is the crucial picture, so you should understand or at least remember this picture. Uh, if you want to calculate this contribution to the power spectrum today, to the amount of uh, correlation between different perturbation modes today, we do some integral over momentum running through this loop, and it's generally equal to infinity. 
So this is something that particle physicists know very well. In fact, this kind of uh, way of doing cosmological perturbation theory is not a recent development. It goes back to the 1980s. My Caltech colleague Mark Wise and others set up uh, this parallelism between cosmic perturbation theory and quantum field theory. And in standard cosmological perturbation theory, you just give up. You just say, well, the validity of the method ceases to apply at this uh, scale where you basically cut off this loop momentum. You just don't include contributions from very, very high wave numbers. And then you say that's the answer and, and you shouldn't trust your perturbation theory anymore. Now, other people have been more ambitious. There was a few years ago um, fuss about, is it possible that the reason why the universe is accelerating not because there's dark energy, but because there is back reaction from cosmological perturbations. So there's obviously in the universe, there's matter and energy, but there's also the gravitational interactions between them, and the universe is not perfectly smooth. So uh, some people, uh, Tony Riotto, Rocky Cobb, and others said, look, if the effective contribution, if the, if the contribution we calculate from loops like this is infinity, then clearly it's not infinity, but maybe it's big. <laughs> so maybe the effective contribution of the nonlinearities is actually greater than the contribution from the matter itself. And it turns out that that was not right. It was a good try, but the effective field theory approach will give you the answer, uh, no problem. It wasn't a good try. It was clear from the start that it was nonsense. I'm trying to be, I'm being recorded and, and live streamed here. I need to be very polite to everybody. So it was a good try. It was a good try in the sense that, yeah, it was, I, I think it was worth the try. Maybe you could have seen that it was wrong instantly, but that's easier to say in hindsight. I, I never believed it myself, but I thought it was a good try. I'll stand by that. I'll be more honest later about other things. Okay, <laughs> so um, what should we be doing? So in standard perturbation theory, we just kind of give up. Um, maybe we should be doing something better, effective field theory. So here's effective field theory. Let's, this is a, a different cutoff function, smoothing function in K space. We're basically gonna take this function W that says keep all of the low wave numbers and set all the high wave numbers to zero. In uh, Photoshop, that means a Gaussian blur on the picture that you import. So here is a simulation of large scale structure, uh, dark matter, and I just blurred it a little bit, and now I get a smooth density field. And this is what I'm gonna look for the effective theory of. In other words, I'm gonna take my phi, my density field or my velocity field or whatever, I'm gonna multiply it by the smoothing function in K space. I'm gonna call the result the long wavelength field. Then by application of advanced mathematics, I'm gonna have the short wavelength field, which is phi minus the long wavelength field. It's everything that I threw away. Then when I take my equation of motion for phi and plug in this decomposition into long and short, I will get interactions between the long wavelengths and the short wavelengths. And I will try my best to eliminate the short wavelengths from the equations, to get an equation purely for the long wavelength field. And I will call that integrating out the short wavelength field. So here is, to, to get to Andre's question, why, why should we care? I mean, after all, there are simulations, right? I can put it in a box. This is not a uh, picture of the evolution. This is just zooming in on the final result of the millennium simulation, Volker, Springer, and other people. Uh, you can see they have done a big box of particles, 10 billion particles, and they have a lot of dynamic range. You can go from very large distances, many gigaparsecs, to relatively small distances. And you're zooming in here on a, a particularly lumpy bit of matter. What we're saying is that much of this work didn't need to be done. You hit the nonlinearity scale about 10 megaparsecs. So you really only hear, are you truly nonlinear? And everything on longer wavelengths than that, we can do with pencil and paper. We need the input from the short wavelength physics. So our strategy would be, what we would advocate, if we knew what we were talking about, is you should spend your computational power getting the nonlinear short wavelength interactions, uh, the, the, the development of actual galaxies and clusters and so forth, understood as well as possible. And then we will use those as input into our effective field theory, which we can just do using pencil and paper. So now it gets worse. Okay. So what does that mean physically? So sure. can I interrupt you? Yeah. Um, surely people like Peebles or whatever, his pupils, 
did go beyond first order perturbation theory. Yeah. Right? And so is your approach like um, you and Matthias somehow dramatically different from it the is. previous attempts? It is, and I will later on I will actually show you a plot of how much better it is. The point is that they you can do any order you want. But as the wavelength you're interested in approaches the nonlinearity scale, you are your errors grow out of control, and there's so no way to you fix that. You guys are outperforming classical approach. Absolutely, yes, that's right. I, I strongly claim that the, the effective field theory gives you a much better answer than what we call standard perturbation theory. So it's not just I can do long wavelengths because they're linear. I can take into account the back reaction of the short wavelengths on the long wavelengths in a way that standard perturbation theory can't do. So that's what, that's what we're doing here. So this is what we want. We want an effective theory for the long wavelength modes all by themselves. Short wavelengths, things are nonlinear, galaxies, stars, whatever is going on, we can't keep track of that. But maybe we can get something just for the long wavelengths. So maybe the second order piece is just the combination of two first order pieces and you get a simple Feynman diagram like that. But we also have the the induced effects, the back reaction from the turning on small scales that can interact with the large scales. So either a bunch of short wavelength modes, this is just sort of a schematic way of saying that there's nonlinearity. The short wavelengths, many, many things happen. We bundle them all up into a final answer, and some short wavelength mode can bump into a long wavelength mode and affect its evolution. Or two short wavelength modes can bump into each other and form a long wavelength mode. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the final answer. So the improvement that we're supposed to get is that we're supposed to be able to take all of these nonlinear effects that we don't understand and extract out the one part we need. How do they affect the long wavelength modes? So how do you do that? That's what we want to do. How do you actually technically do it? You might just say, well, maybe I can just take an expectation value and I would get into local effective field theory. And in quantum field theory, that's essentially what you do. In this classical field theory, it does, it does not work. We have to be a little bit more clever than that. So this is less intimidating than it looks. Remember, here's our equation, phi dot phi, phi star phi. We're going to smooth the whole thing. We're going to multiply the whole thing by our smoothing function to kill off the short wavelengths. So the phi dot becomes phi L dot, the phi becomes phi L. And the interaction term, you decompose. There's a long wavelength piece all by itself. There's interactions between long and short, and there's short interacting with itself. So here is the thing that, that I think that we did a little bit better than anyone else has done yet in this game. We explain as clearly as possible what you really need to do to eliminate phi s from this equation, which is you think of phi s as a functional of phi l. That is to say, you ask yourself, what would the short wavelength modes do if there weren't any long wavelength modes? And then you ask yourself, well, what is the influence of the long wavelength modes on the short wavelength modes? And you get a set, you get an, uh, a power series for what the short wavelength modes do. And that looks like, this is probably the worst slide, I don't know. That looks like this. Here is the, a very formal expression for what the short wavelength modes do. Namely, they do whatever they do if there weren't long wavelength modes. And then there's this integral, which is the next correction. It's proportional to the long wavelength modes. And then there are other terms proportional to phi L squared and phi L cubed and so forth. Diagrammatically, this means the short wavelength modes do their little nonlinear thing all by themselves or they are affected a little bit by phi L, or they're affected by two different phi Ls, and so forth. It's just a formal power series. But what it does is it gives us an expression which we can then sort of call this integral something and plug it into, as a parameter, into the effective field theory. But your short wavelength modes are not even describable as a Newtonian fluid because they are not a fluid, right? They Absolutely. And I don't yeah. care. And yet you, well, you don't care. I don't but care. You realize that they are not part of your formalism, really. They're not. I'm never going to tell you what phi S0 is. Okay. <laughs> I don't need to. 
the, and so this is, this is the, the trickiest slide that I have, because I'm telling you two things that are both important, but sort of morally are pointing in the opposite direction. One is good news. I have this phi s0 that I, that I can eliminate from my equation. I don't need to know what it is. It serves a role, but only as an intermediate step, not in the final answer. That's the good news. The bad news is the, the expansion for this involves integrals over time. And this integral doesn't go away. So I integrate over where this phi L is coming from. And that's something that doesn't happen in quantum field theory. In quantum field theory, all the effects of the electron in the photon scattering could be encompassed in a point interaction, a vertex. Here, the effect of these back reactions of the churning short wavelength modes necessarily involves an integral between the initial conditions and today. And what that means is that the effective back reaction is non-local in time. The final answer will not, strictly speaking, be a local effective field theory. It's hard even to draw diagrams for it, but we tried. So here is the third order component for the long wavelength field. It's like three different initial conditions combining to make one little perturbation. And then you get that's all by itself in the, in the phi long theory uh, at the linear level. And then you get nonlinear effects from short wavelengths that can sort of poke in there once or twice or three times. All of these diagrams are just saying short wavelength modes can interact with each other to make a long wavelength mode. And you also have this new weird thing that we're not quite sure what to make of yet. In addition to sort of the individual fields, you have this time integral that changes as the propagation happens. And it seems irreducible. You could sort of expand the integral in moments or something like that, but honestly, this is where, we're, this is where we need more insight. We're not quite sure what to do about this. So why is it different? Why is cosmology different than quantum field theory? Why is it not a conventional fluid description? Well, there's two things going on. One is that in the quantum field theory, the loop that we are integrating over is really virtual particles. Like we said, if you're at momenta below the electron mass, this is all sort of stuck in one place. The, elect the virtual electrons don't go very far. They don't travel over large distances. In cosmology, the thing that we're integrating over is short wavelengths, but short wavelengths doesn't mean confined to a short distance. A short wavelength perturbation can propagate over the entire universe very easily. So the diagrams don't look like this. The diagrams look like this. You start with some short wavelength mode, it propagates for billions of years before it interacts with a long wavelength mode. The other, that's one thing. The other thing is that the actual values of the short wavelength modes are not purely determined by dynamics. In quantum field theory, these electrons aren't real. They're virtual. We know exactly what they do on the basis of the Dirac equation or whatever. It's local physics that is telling us what they do. In cosmological perturbation theory, these short wavelength modes are evolving from the initial conditions. So if I don't tell you what the initial conditions are, I don't know what the short wavelength modes would do in principle. So there's these two different factors that come into making the effective theory of cosmological perturbations a little more complicated. What we do is just ignore all those problems and press on. So here we are. Uh, I, I've said this like three times already, but this is probably the worst slide I think that we have for the whole time. Okay. <laughs> Uh, here is what we are after. After all that work, what are we trying to get? We're trying to get a small but potentially crucially important correction to the prediction for the power spectrum of perturbations today. So in particular, you might look at the correction from effective field theory to the power spectrum for a first order mode and a third order mode. And you write that as an integral over time, like we just said. And it turns out, sorry, this is a, I shouldn't have said that. This is a different time integral. But you write that as a new, as a new uh, you can encompass it in this integral. This term, this correction to the correlation function, is equivalent to not doing effective th field theory, but rather changing the classical equations that you first started with. Changing them by adding a new term proportional to phi. 
This is exactly what you expect. This is what effective field theory is supposed to be about. Effective field theory is supposed to be about taking all the small scale stuff and bundling it up into changes of the equation of motion of the large scale stuff. We find exactly that. This correction to this power spectrum is exactly of the form adding a new term C, a new uh, linear term, to the equation of motion for phi. The difference is that rather than C being determined purely locally by what's going on inside the galaxy, it's determined by this time integral of initial conditions, this complicated, ugly thing. So the next step, the, the thing we need the brilliant young people to do, is to figure out how best to calculate or estimate or simulate this integral to make the effective field theory more effective. So the, the fact that you have divergences in the other approach, does it mean that here you have some unknown parameter to be put? Yes, that's right. So that's the next slide. Very, very good. So here's the final answer, okay? After all that, you've been very patient. You've seen my equations and so forth. This is the final answer. This is the theory we started with. So it's two equations, one for the density perturbation, one for the velocity. There are interactions between delta and theta. And after doing your effective field theory, you get new equations with corrections. You get a new term in the equation for delta, which is proportional to delta. It's actually, this is Fourier space, so this is k squared delta, which means the second derivative of delta. So your corrections are higher derivative, which you expect. <coughs> and there's also a k squared theta. And over here in the equation for theta, there's a k squared delta and a k squared theta as well. So basically you have every new term at the linear level that you would have expected to have, we calculate. We have an explicit expression for what it is. We also have a interpretation for what this means. These are terms that people who do fluid mechanics for a living know about. This is a speed of sound, if you get a k squared delta in the equation for the velocity. This is a viscosity. This, these terms are heat conduction. So the particles move, but the energy density moves in a slightly different way, because heat can move in a slightly different way. You shouldn't denote viscosity and sound speed by the same letter. I, I wouldn't have, but I'm following notation that other people have used. I know. Crazy, because this would be vector velocity. Uh, transverse and CS longitudinal. That's the only way to read this equation. I, I, could, uh, I could not agree more, but I, I lack the courage of my convictions. I'm still young. So, yes, this is the viscosity. <laughs> this is the sound speed. In, the, in these papers, there's like five different C squareds with different subscripts. It really is quite annoying. But anyway, you get the point. It's the sound speed and the viscosity. So one of the things we did in our paper, which we thought was new, was we proved you needed these heat conduction terms. Sadly, we were a little slow, so Mercoli and Pyre showed it a couple months before we got our paper out. So they get all the credit for this, which they deserve. They showed that it used to be thought, in the first few papers, it used to be thought that the sound speed and the viscosity were the only new parameters you need. That's not true. You also need these heat conduction terms, which is exactly what you should expect. These are the terms that you can write down that are consistent with the symmetries of the theory. Theory, that's what effective field theory tells you to do. So just to remind you, the one that this is the nice news, this is the good news, the weird news is that these parameters are not only determined by local physics, they're determined by an integral over time. And to be honest, it's only in perturbation theory at first order that we can actually prove to you that this integral over time collapses to a single number, that you just do the integral and it's a number times the original fields. So there's more formalism to be developed here. Uh, nevertheless, you can sort of guess the answer and do pretty well. So I don't know exactly what to say about this because our own uh, contributions have been mostly formal. The other groups have been ahead of us in terms of actually comparing to realistically interesting quantities. And they claim that they can make ansatzes for these time-dependent things that do more than well enough. I can't judge whether or not that's true or not. It's probably true, but we haven't done it ourselves. It's certainly one of the things that needs to be gotten right moving forward. So. That's the formalism. I want to end on something more inspirational than this. I really, I, I said early on that I think this is a, a very interesting way forward, and I want to sort of leave that as the final message in your heads. Uh, we induce these parameters, you can calculate values. The speed of sound that you get is about one thousandth the speed of light, which is an interesting number. That's more or less what you'd expect in cosmology, but now you can calculate it. Standard perturbation theory is good, roughly speaking, up to wavelengths of 14 megaparsecs. 
The claim uh, by Carrasco and collaborators is that the effective field theory is good at not quite an order of magnitude, but, but quite a few, uh, a factor of quite a few better, six or seven times better than standard perturbation theory. That might not sound like a lot, but remember what you're doing is me you're measuring modes in a box, and the number of modes you have to measure goes as k cubed. So every little bit of k that you improve your accuracy, you get many more modes that you can measure. And in modern cosmology, with large-scale structure surveys and weak lensing and so forth, we are measuring these modes. Comparing the predictions, every little bit that you can go to smaller scales will be enormously more information you can get from the observations. So here's a plot from Carrasco et al. that tries to make you enthusiastic about effective field theory. So this is, it's a little slightly weird what they're plotting here. This is the density power spectrum today, but they have normalized it by a function of density. So it, there's no immediate physical interpretation for this except comparing the different curves to each other. So this olive covered, colored curve here is what you would get numerically. You do a numerical simulation in a standard program, this is the power spectrum that you would get. And so you think you believe that, although it just takes work to run the code. You would like to do better, but you think it's probably pretty good. This is the answer you would have gotten if you only did linear perturbation theory, ignoring the interactions. And that you don't expect that that's right when you're on the nonlinear scale, so it's not right, so that makes sense. This is the result from what's called standard perturbation theory. This is what Jim Peebles would have told you back in the 1970s or 80s. You see, once you hit the nonlinear scale, before, you know, when things are linear, everything is fine, everything matches. At the nonlinear scale, the standard perturbation theory begins to go wrong pretty noticeably. And here is the effective field theory result at one loop order. At two loop order, you claim to do even better, and so forth. So I can't 100% promise you that I believe this plot, because I think that there are these little formal uh, onsatses that they're making. I would like to do better. But I totally believe that you can do this well, that this is uh, something you can do and put the very, very large scale structure people out of business. But that might not even be the real um, benefit to this technique. The thing that got us interested first was actually calculating the CMB. Why? Well, because it's an obvious thing to calculate in, in cosmology. And it is linear, and you should be able to do it. You should be able to take into account all those nonlinearities. Formally, it's much harder. It's no longer a pressureless fluid that you're calculating anymore. So it's a lot more work. And it was trying to figure out that extra work that got us backwards, moving backwards and backwards into the, the origins of the formalism. So we're now going to try to go back and do the CMB. But perhaps even more interesting is physics other than cold dark matter. There's various little hints from the data that you would do better at fitting galaxies in large scale structure if the dark matter was not completely cold or not completely non-interacting. If there were little, you know, if there were self-interactions of the dark matter and so forth. The effective field theory approach is tailor-made for studying that kind of stuff. It's saying you're adding new small scale physics. The effective field theory says all that does is change the parameters of my effective field theory, and there's only four of them. So no matter what your small scale physics is, I'm just measuring four parameters. So understanding what large scale structures should look like in theories of modified dark matter physics is something that is going to be a great application, the killer app for effective field theory. Because I know you want more formalism, we also did a whole new approach using the renormalization group, which I encourage the more uh, formally minded people who don't like data to think about. Uh, all right, so there we are. I think that this is a wonderful, like I said, it's, a, it's new, it's kind of new. You, know, you could have done it in the 70s, but people didn't. And the reason, obviously, why people are doing it now is that the observations are better, that we have more data. Before, it was fine to do sort of things pretty well as far as calculating uh, the evolution of large-scale structure. Now you need things to percent level and better. Two-loop effects are actually kind of crucially important, and I would not be at all surprised if three loops or higher were crucially important as well. And I think this is a wonderful formalism for doing it. It's interesting to the sort of pure theorist slash mathematician in us because it's not a conventional effective field theory. We are able in perturbation theory to bundle up the non-conventional effects into integrals that, that give us the final answer. But maybe there's something clever that actually lets us do that integral in a general way. I don't know. I'm still sort of thinking about that. 
Finally, uh, it really is practical. I think that the people who do the large-scale surveys and the analysts who compare CMB and local data to each other have not yet jumped on the effective field theory bandwagon, uh, partly because we have not yet presented our results in the most helpful way. But that is absolutely something we're going to do. And I think that as we, uh, we move forward into the precision cosmology era, this is going to be one of the most important tools in the toolbox. Thank you. But everybody but Andre. You, you. Everybody but Andre, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think the comparison you make between SPT and EFT is a bit misleading because SPT, you are basically, net, when you say EFT is better, because you are using three parameters of the theory to fit to the simulation. So, of course, it better be better because you are feeding. Right? That's a crucial piece of information. I'm not passing moral judgments. I'm just saying that I think that... But if you compare two things and one that's better than the other, and you don't say that in the second one you're fitting a free parameter... Sure. There are more parameters in the effective field theory approach, that but... fit to the simulation. Yeah, and you need to fit them to simulation exactly like, you know, in, in quantum field theory, when you do effective field theories, uh, your low energy parameters, things you measure, but then once you measure them, you can calculate new things. So it, it is absolutely true you're adding new parameters, but the number of things you can calculate is larger than the number of parameters you add. And for those things you want to calculate, I think this will do better. That is the... But that remains to be seen. There is no prediction as far as... Remains to be seen. That's fine, yes. Okay, yeah. All right. Okay, you go first. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, this is uh, nice, and uh, uh, but, but it applies uh, to uh, ideal uh, uh, to the quantum matter. Uh, as you know, I mean, in simulations, in uh, in observations, we we don't measure this. So it is maybe questionable the utility of, of all of this. Uh, as applied to, to uh, actual observations. Well, yeah, I would say that... There's yeah, bias, and as is the distortion, and uh, you know that in this approach you cannot really go uh, beyond the linear. Well, I think you come closer to the nonlinear scale in this approach uh, than you do in standard perturbation theory, but the... I mean, hopefully, obviously, uh, the wavelengths on which we think this is applicable are ones where bias is a less important problem. But certainly every approach to cosmological perturbation theory has a mismatch between what you calculate and what you observe because you don't observe the dark matter. So I don't think it's any worse in this approach than in anybody else's approach. But, but it's worse than simulation. Well, I think, it's, I think that you could combine them. I mean, I think that the things to be simulated are the small scale physics and you can do analytic large scale stuff and I think that's the most efficient way to get the best answer. I mean, I don't do this for a living, like I said, so I could be wrong there, but I, I definitely think that having this analytic control over this regime that gets very, very close to the nonlinear scale is, seems very useful. I just curious, in terms of uh, picking up on this last issue, so if, if the numerical work moved to more small scale structure, I'm just trying to understand exactly what what they would do. Can it, can it be reduced to basically a few numbers, or because you have this time interval, they right. imagine like a whole like whole kind of a selection of different uh, small scale structures that they would simulate and get up. Yeah, that's right. So in principle, what you want to do is you want to extract these four numbers. And that's, that's the job of it. To the extent that what you care about is the evolution of the large scale modes, the information you need from either simulations or observations. But those numbers now include this time interval. These numbers are expressed in our formalism as an integral over time. And as far as we know, there's no way to not do that. There's no, and physically, it makes sense. You shouldn't be able to express it just as something right. going on right. locally. So the simulation people need to do whole ensembles of different things to essentially have some function of the time interval or something. As far as I can tell, they need to actually keep the data from their simulations as a function of time, and then they could do it. Yeah, I was going to So you have an effective field theory to describe large-scale structure, and in the simulation, it looks like there are these filament things. Mm -hmm. what? Do you have like a sort of analytic description of these cosmic filaments in your effective field theory? Uh, you know, it should be. I mean, that's that's way above my pay grade. I know exactly what you're asking, um, but 
you know, the, the, film, the filaments are a lot more vivid before you smooth than after you smooth. So uh, if you, roughly speaking, what I'd be tempted to say is, once you get to the point where the filaments are easy to see, you're probably nonlinear, and you shouldn't be trusting this. That is not where I would advocate this as a useful tool. So they're not like solitonic solutions? No, no, because solitons by, by construction are nonlinear. Uh, let's move this discussion to the sixth floor of our wine and cheese.